My name's Paul Stebsack. I work for the Wales Cooperative at the moment, uh, Wales Cooperative Centre. But I think for this, the purpose of today, I'm not going to advocate the SLA process as, as such. I'm going to give you my journey. So this is how I've interpreted, interpreted everything. So today I'm going to look, look at the sustainable livelihoods approach in Wales and its role in relation to co-production and asset-based community development. So my background is um, I originally started in the sector back in 2005. Um, where I um, was taken on as a community development worker for Communities First in Glencoe. A little bit of history on the area. 19, it was built in the 1950s to take, um, cater for the coal industry. Um, declined in the 80s when the coal industry finished. And population of 3,000, 1,500 houses. And in 2005, when I first moved there, there was over 100 void properties with these big metal grids in front of every th person's window. So it looked horrendous. Um, key stats at that time, 45% unemployment, 45% of 16 year olds with no qualifications and we were 13 out of 365 for health badly on the, on the WIM de uh, deprivation index. Um, so in 2005 I was part of a new Communities First team which was appointed. Um, we walked into a, a bit of a uphill struggle, um, nothing to do with the, the previous um, team which was there before us. I think a mixed message of what Communities First was initially went out. The community believed that this team of people are going to come to your community and give you loads of money and you're going to be able to do everything. But then when they found out they had to work for it and we were facilitators, it was a, it was a, a bit of a difficult struggle. And so they'd done a, gone through a lot of consultation, but not much had really progressed in those first five years. So. We were holding these while we were told to do partnership meetings and there was more service providers there than people. And what we've quickly found out is that the people would rather do action than come to meetings. And unfortunately, because we were only having, we were literally having two, three, four people from the community turning up to these meetings, they were deciding what the whole community wanted, whether those community members knew that they wanted or not. So, but we found out that, like I say, they would rather do stuff rather than talk about it. So in 2006, we approached um, Community Development Cymru and a gentleman called John Duff came to us with a new way of working. It was simultaneously at the same, it was more or less the same time as where our budgets were kind of cut and we were given programme bending instead of like large sums of money to do things. But really that worked in a massive benefit to us because we realised we had to be more shrewd of what we, we did and it changed the way that we worked from that day forth. Basically what we decided we would do, would, would, we would choose um, three thematic themes which are chosen by the original partnership meeting. So at the time I think they were active, in, active citizenship, education and health and we would only concentrate on those themes. Each theme would have its own independent meeting and we would bring all the service providers and all the possible beneficiaries and interested parties from the community together and instead of coming up with a plan of what we were going to do on a, pro on a, like a linear process of you know doing consultation, doing some planning, doing some action, to, doing some evaluation. We wanted it on a cycle process. So we start off with a concept or an idea here and it just keeps on growing. And as it grows and grows, so, so for example, with adult education, as it grew, um, there's, a, there's a photograph later on in the presentation where in our meeting in 2012, we had over 100 people in the room, 60 different service providers and 40 different community members. And that becomes unmanageable then. But then that would spin off smaller like specialist areas so you'd have an adult education you'd have a you know school education so we adopted that and from there this is before we even knew about the word co-production we realized then we're suddenly co-production projects because we as communities first were in the middle basically trying to in ensure that we have that equal approach that the service providers couldn't come into Glencoe and say we're going to deliver this they had to be more or less invited in. And the community had to basically, um, we'd have to evidence the need basically. The community would ask us what they wanted and we would work with the service providers to fulfill that need. But the one thing we found is the balance of power. We sat in this middle at this time, this is community first when we were capacity builders and we had the service users on the one side and the service providers on the other. But we always found we would try and maintain this balance of equality and reciprocity. But whenever we would kind of step back for a little bit, not necessarily 
intentionally, but the service provider would start to take control again. Um, so that was a difficult thing for us. So we went back to John Duff and CDC Cymru said, this is a little bit of a problem that we're having. And he came to us in 2007, uh, 2007 with the Sustainable Livelihoods approach. He'd recently been working with Oxfam and he wanted to pilot it through us. So what is SRA? So person-centred, assets-based approach to community development. And what does it do? It's a methodology, I would say, it's like ABCD for people. It's about people finding their assets and basically maximising on the things that they've got. So what it does, it helps people tackle with their own core issues rather than looking at a superficial problem or a wealth of problems on an area. It's about looking at an individual. Dry mouth. Uh, enable persons to identify and maximise the use of their existing assets. So it helps them look, to look at all the things that they've actually got in life and to harness those and to go on from there. And it encourages the creation of asset-based solutions. So we're not being dependent on a service to fix something. It's about looking at the things that you've got within your mitts, within your reams, the people that you know, the organisations you know, to help find a solution which is more bespoke and fitted to need. And in doing so, it then fosters uh, collaboration. So basically what we were finding is that if the parents wanted a youth provision, they would work alongside Communities First and they would long, uh, work alongside um, the um, uh, local authority to basically co-design a service, basically. But then they still had their input and they had that element of a control to basically um, take that forward. So... What assets make a livelihood? And I think we talked about the complexity of the word assets. The Oxfam definition is that there's five different types. So there's human assets, financial, physical, public, and social. And so it's about helping an individual to map what assets they've got in each of these fields so that they have like this wealth, a list of different things that when a problem comes, to them or they're looking for guidance they've got this wealth of diff a different range of different people services methodologies that they can access to to resolve that issue themselves and we did that through um there's a set of tools which i can share with people um which basically drag each of these out so you can create this big map so it's not the only per, uh, to get some person-centred approach. There's lots of person-centred pro approaches. There. The one which I'm referring to is the Oxfam Sustainable Livelihoods in Wales. Um, also, Jedra Institute in Australia. And I've got some on my own website. So how did we embed it? Well, it's basically, it's not a watered-down process. We would find those uh, individuals which are the movers and shakers in your community. And we would work specifically with them. Because when they are involved and we build their capacity, they will be they will bring those other people in and they were integral to the process and the development of what happened in Glencoe, which was um we created Glencoe community regeneration uh, so that's an organization which later became my employer which was there as a vehicle to take Glencoe beyond the community first process we built a lovely 1.2 million pound community center um we organically created one of the very first work clubs in Communities First, so it was through demand that people wanted us to help them find employment, so we created it, but then supported by staff, it became a volunteer-led. The number of adult learner qualifications went up from 25 to 400 within five years because the, the community were deciding what they wanted to learn, and we were getting the service providers to basically fill into them. Um, because we had a vested interest in the environment one year, one of the themes of the environment the local authority pro approached us and they invested £1,000 in Glencoe, £100,000, sorry, in Glencoe, um, to try and make it um, a zero waste community. Um, that year, I think we recycled 94% of uh, waste. And in 2007, we generated 40,000 hours of volunteering. My throat is really dry. <laughs> so, other things, in 2010, the community built their own community park on a budget of £2,000. community always wanted a play area, um, and through this process, um, through our environmental theme, I think we had seven different organisations coming together, but uh, about 100 different people from like 4 to 84 give 800 hours of their time where they built a park. 
Um, by 2012, there was a wait and list to live in Glencore, so we didn't have those 100 value properties. We had more people coming in. So this is a diagram that I've come up with. This is mine. So, uh, and it's not definitive, it's just th something I use. I was looking at how, how to build sustainable resilient communities, and I was looking at ABCD and CoPro, and I think, right, I'm sure I saw a tweet. If not, I dreamt it, and if I dreamt it, I'm really sad. Uh, attempt of Russell Cormack saying, you can't have co-production without uh, ABCD and vice versa. I am right. I'm, I'm not having really sad dreams, that's okay. <laughs> But for me, personally, I think in order, to, as your strongest asset is people, and co-production needs that, I find it difficult, personally, to have this process without empowering those individuals. And to empower those individuals, you need some sort of uh, person-centered approach. So my final slide is, um, yeah, the, 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 the final thoughts really is, my difficulty was, once communities first changed into a more delivery model, I think we kind of lost that element of co-production and it was very difficult to sustain, and I think it is now. So my difficulty is, while we were communities first, we, I'm going on this one, we managed this. But when that was taken away, it quickly revolves back there. So it's about how do we maintain a co-productive process without this? Is it possible? I don't know. And that's something that I'd like to ask the group today. Thank you.